Chris, obviously you have uh, extensive experience, but before we talk about your current role with the World Bank, you, you previously were uh, in the White House working in the technology area there. Give us a sense of, of, of how the White House has changed uh, an organisation that we're used to only thinking about in a, in a very political sense. But how's technology uh, changing the, the way the White House does business? Um, well, actually, I'm going to show my age. The, the President Obama, who you write, I, I was uh, most recently working for, is the fourth president that I've worked for. My first president was Ronald Reagan, and then I worked for George Bush the first, and then Bill Clinton taking a little time off and now coming back. And so, you know, every, the world has changed. Uh, they used to talk about news, you know, ending at, at close of business, and then you had a free period before you started the next day. It, everything is 24 by 7 now. So you have to be aware, you have to be on, you have to be ready, and you have to be willing to maneuver and uh, solve problems You know, 24 by 7. So I think that is both a change in and of itself, but it's also been enabled by technology. And I think the Obama administration has very successfully understood those changes and incorporated those changes into its very DNA. Um, certainly, if you look at the election, I was not allowed to participate in that election from that standpoint. Uh, but if you look at what he was, what his team did with the election was absolutely brilliant in terms of understanding data and how to use it to understand the behaviors of voters. You also look at what he's done with his uh, with his staff. Um, my boss, when I was there, uh, the chief technology officer of the United States actually reports directly to him. The chief information officer, interestingly enough, does not. And it's a new position under the Obama administration, and it's really intended to figure out how technology can be used almost at every piece of policy, every piece of legislation, every action, and incorporates the transformative power of technology, the, at least the potential of it, into everything that goes across the president's desk. And so I think it, it is the reflective of the very nature of technology in society in that it is core to everything we do. So President Obama thinks of everything in, in technological terms. How can technology create value or, or change the situation or empower it? Absolutely. And uh, uh, certainly uh, makes it uh, both challenging and absolutely one of the most fascinating jobs is to be in that environment. One of the things that the uh, Obama administration has very much supported is this idea of actually releasing government data. The, the belief here is that there's so much value locked up in databases or you know, old filing cabinets, to use that analogy, and if that information, if that data could be released and other people use it, other entrepreneurs, other government organizations, other anybody, uh, that amazing things can happen. And that's indeed what's happened. His very first day on the job, the first, one of the first actions he did was actually sign an executive order asking that the government be opened up and giving direction to other agencies to actually instruct individual agencies on how to open up. And over, let's say, I guess six years now, we've seen just amazing changes uh, in the business community. For example, insurance companies taking open data and changing their business model or Walgreens, which is an American pharmaceutical company, changing how they look at where the pharmacist is. You know, rather than in the back of the organ of the of the business, putting them in front and center, and letting them download personally identifiable, safe, and secure data, so that the consumer can have that data, can talk with the pharmacist right there in front, and make decisions. That is all because we've let that data be free and allowed other people to take and create value with it. What about this issue uh, on the one side that, you know, the, the, the value that comes from opening the data and then governments obviously having to manage that information correctly around privacy issues and obviously the US is, is currently immersed in potentially a new issue in that area uh, which is only we've got you know early days on yet but but is this going to become an issue down the track that that we're going to have to think a lot more about about almost the separation that will need to exist between on the one hand opening up the data but on the other being very careful about the way it's actually managed. I think uh, the current situation however it unfolds is just a good reminder that 
that um, government is different from private sector. There's no question about that. And that when government starts thinking about how to be entrepreneurial, how to uh, unlock the value and enable others uh, to create um, new businesses or products or services, that there is, it has to be very thoughtfully done. And there's just no question about that. Now, my personal belief is the current crisis is, is that we're in is more about policy decisions rather than freeing up data and making it available for entrepreneurs or other people to use. Uh, but n without a doubt, it is it needs to be thoughtfully done and carefully done. And I think uh, crises like this are not necessarily bad things, but they're actually good reminders about what we need to pay attention to. And in terms of opening up data, you've seen in your role in the World Bank some very tangible examples of the value that can come from that comes from that, particularly around things like hackathons. Just talk us through uh, some of the innovation that's been going on in the World Bank about how you uh, you bring an organisation like that into the 21st century, particularly around its thinking. Well, you know, hackathons started off uh, you know years ago as kind of this opportunity to get a bunch of people together and uh, you know talk around, sit around, and and create some things and see what happens. Over time, the model has evolved and become much more um, uh, organized and much more mature, I guess is the word I'm using. And one of the things that we've done at the World Bank is look at it and, and understand that the hackathon is a tool that has multiple layers of effectiveness. Certainly, by releasing data, bringing people together, either hacking at home or coming to a place and hacking uh, together creates uh, some synergies, some great ideas, and some prototypes for some applications. Oftentimes, however, it just stops right there. And what we're trying to do is change that model and keep that energy going, keep the value added uh, steps uh, happening. And so what we've done now, two actually, one in water and most recently in sanitation, where we're actually using the hackathon certainly to come up with a, uh, uh, an application at the end, but actually using it to educate and inform the institution itself. So in this case with the World Bank, um, we used it to show how we really oftentimes start solving problems because we think we know the answer. And in development, that's long been a criticism of organizations like the World Bank, that they're very paternalistic, that they dictate, they don't listen. And so a hackathon is a wonderful opportunity to address that and hopefully change the presumption and allow many more people enabled by technology now to participate, to have their say, and to create interesting and accurate problem statements that would never have been possible if we had just done what we think and told people what to do. And it's been an amazing journey over the last year and year and a half, I guess, uh, with these two hackathons. And I think what the bank has learned is that hackathon is a good thing, that it can be very effective in both understanding the needs of our customers, whether they be the individual citizen or the country, but also exposing us to many, many more options of solutions and how we can actually start addressing the problems that we have been facing for so long. I mean, you know, the insanity, uh, trying to solve problems the same way over and over and over again, and we're just trying to break that cycle. What do you think is driving this innovation? Is this, is this Gen Y? Is this, is this a, a, a new generation coming in with, equipped with technology thinking and, and, and a sense of empowerment to go and solve some of the, these problems? What are, the, what are the drivers behind it, do you think? Oh, absolutely. But I, I think, let, let me first state that, you know, uh, the ideas that we're talking about today are not new. Um, you know, uh, technology professionals over the years have talked about this. I think what the first thing I'll say is that technology is actually getting to the point of maturity where we can actually do all of those Star Trekian things that Gene Roddenberry thought of back in the 60s. I mean, we're now getting there to that point. So the maturity of technology, I, I think, is one thing. I think second is the, the recognition that... Um, uh, you just can't keep solving problems the same old way. 
that uh, if we're actually going to solve some of these problems, we need to think differently. And innovation, I think, is the latest buzzword. I'm not sure we overuse it, I think. But simply taking advantage of all the changes that have taken place and just applying them and thinking through just you know slightly differently, I think is, and maybe that is innovation, but um, that's what I think is changing. And, and, and you're, you're, you're right. Um, I think there is the youth aspect or the younger generation who actually is far more comfortable with this, doesn't understand people of my generation and why we have difficulty with it. And I think as they move you know, increasingly into the workforce, they are bringing that openness, that um, sense of, of fearlessness when it comes to te technology, and they're bringing that and they're teaching us how to, um, how to use it. And it's amazing, isn't it, that when the government makes this information available, and you've, you've seen some experience from this from your time in San Francisco as well, a, a, a city that has been very open about, about sharing uh, d data, and we know that this is part of a global trend at the moment, government's sort of moving into this, but is this something that you think is really going to continue to gather momentum over time? That's a good question. I, I hope it does. I, I don't know. It, it all depends upon whether government is willing to put the work in to work with the community, to, you know, to create the fancy word, the ecosystem, in order to take that data and really turn it into economic value. You can't just release it. It's not something where you release it and they will come. You need to understand uh, the value of your data. You need to know enough of your entrepreneurial community to invite them in, to take a look at that data, to entice them to take it and build something with it. And when they do, to exploit that in a positive way and celebrate the success and then use that to get more people involved and you just kind of repeat that cycle over and over and over again and I would argue one of the reasons that the Obama administration has been successful is they have dedicated people and resources consistently over six years now in order to do that if we had not done that I don't think we would see the amazing transformation in the business community as a result so I think it, the, uh, it, it, will, it, it remains to be seen what will actually happen out of this, but I think all indications are that this is being embedded into the DNA of government, and I think increasingly it's in being embedded into the DNA of business community, and I think it's not going to stop because there's just enough momentum going. So from your own experience in San Francisco, who was the initiator? How did this kick off? And then, and then how quickly did it, did it gather momentum from that point? Well, I think it actually came from my staff. Uh, uh, I think I had some really bright uh, people coming in from the private sector and who understood from their private sector experiences the value of that particular data and information, saw the value in government, and, and convinced me that it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is my leadership, then Mayor Gavin Newsom, um, being a business person himself, immediately when he was presented with this idea, got it and championed it as no mayor had ever done, or at least at that point ever had done. And so he was the one that created the vision. He was the one who basically said, let's um, let's have every government agency do this. He was the one who wrote, when that didn't work, the executive order. I mean, he was the leader, and as CIO and my team, it was it was so much easier for us to actually take that vision and create reality out of it, because he was a leader, and he allowed us to fail, he allowed us to experiment, he allowed us to do all the things we needed to do to make that vision reality. On the face of it, it doesn't seem to make sense, does it, that people would want to willingly give up their time to engage in a whole lot of activities that don't create any specific benefit for them, but they're doing it for almost, you know, the, the, the goodwill nature that they provide back to the city. But it does actually happen. Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, one of the things, uh, biggest lessons learned for me is simply asking not to presume, which we all do, that people are too busy, they're disinterested, they don't like government, they don't trust it, whatever the case may be. People do want to participate. They do want to collaborate and solve problems, especially when those problems are directly affecting them. Um, and so I think combining all of that is, is an amazing opportunity for governments um, to uh, get far more kind of open government going 
but it does require a consistent commitment because the worst thing that can happen is that a government will actually start this process and then do nothing with it. It's just one more example of government not uh, following through on their promises. But if government is willing to do it and stick to it and actually be actively involved and have not only a leader, but leaders in the middle part of as well as those Gen Xers and Ys and Zers, um, then I think it, it will succeed. And you've taken some of this thinking into your new role at the World Bank and you gave an example of uh, a wonderful uh, platform in Africa, Isoko, uh, as, a, as a platform that enables farmers to get uh, more for their crops. Uh, just explain how that platform works and how that's changing the lives of, of uh, the individuals who are able to use that platform. So eSoco is uh, actually means e-marketplace, or marketplace with the e just added in front of it. And the idea here is that you know, data is useless unless it is used for some purpose. And oftentimes those purposes are unknown, but only to the user, the person who is living and dealing with crises or challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. And interestingly enough, agriculture is one of those areas that we people in the city don't often focus on, but it is one of the largest markets for this type of innovation. So what's happening is people are understanding that with a simple SMS phone or phone with SMS capabilities that can take data feeds from different types of um, places can actually create applications that are specifically useful for farmers to understand um, their soil capacity for growing, what crops will grow, what price they will get. Um, and just create a, an application that is, is a wonderful decision-making tool for a farmer. And the example that I gave with Isoko was a woman, and this is on the website, who actually was able to understand that the price being offered in her own community was far less than that being offered in the next community over. And simply by having that information, she was able to say no to the one and yes to the other and actually leverage that income. And that's what it's all about, is creating that economic value. Do you sense that the, world, the ability for the World Bank to do, do deliver meaningful outcomes is now significantly more enhanced and increased as a result of these, these technologies that now exist? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, uh, oftentimes the criticism of large institutions or banks is that they don't really understand what's happening in the field. And what technology is enabling uh, the users of our loans, quite frankly, to say is, wait a minute, the government was borrowing money to do this. We're not seeing that benefit. We're not seeing that actually happening. Where is the feedback of the beneficiary to you, the government, or you, the World Bank, for what you, you're loaning? And I think that is probably the most immediate change that will be happening is that the World Bank will now embed or require this kind of what we call beneficiary feedback into every loan before a loan actually the next payment gets made to a particular country from that loan. And I think that is the true value of what we're doing is holding the World Bank accountable, holding the government accountable for what the money is being spent on. Because if it isn't getting down to the individual, there's a problem somewhere, and it's it's incumbent on both, all parties actually, to make sure that that's understood and stopped. Africa has probably been uh, the continent that's the biggest customer for the World Bank, if we think of it in those terms. And uh, and yet, what's happening there at the moment is truly transformative. But I don't know if the rest of the world has really woken up to you know what is actually taking place in, in Africa. Is is that your sense? I think uh, it is. Uh, I'm, I'm actually just back from Africa, uh, and it is amazing uh, just seeing the energy and the excitement and the um, enthusiasm for solving their own problems. And you know, it's an interesting question of what causes that. But I think that uh, the rest of the world is watching very closely. They are looking at what is being done. They are trying to assess those lessons learned and how they can be applied to their own country. And I, you know, only time will tell whether they're as successful or not. Certainly Africa's uh, capacity to grow is dependent upon a lot of assets like oil, like uh, minerals. Uh, an amazing workforce that's very young 
and an ability to leapfrog over kind of traditional impediments that prevent uh, entrepreneurship from taking place. It's a big place, and uh, they're doing a lot of things. So I think that for, at least for me, it's half of my portfolio of uh, projects. But I think that if you look at other parts of the world, you look at what's happening in Asia, you look at what's happening in the Middle East, when you look what's happening anywhere, you can see that it's not just Africa. And I think that's what's so exciting to people like me who are joining the bank and other uh, organizations, is that this, this excitement, this ability to understand issues and take charge and really work to by the individual to take them out of this situation is is becoming a universal um, attribute of the world, and I think it's in large part because of technology being able to um, allow open communication, open sharing, and open collaboration. And just finally, if, when you are dealing with such complexity and so many problems, <laughs> what realistic goals do you set yourself for your time at the World Bank? Uh, well, we have a new president at the World Bank, and he has said that the new goal uh, for the World Bank is to um, actually solve the poverty problem. For those people who are making more than $1.25 a day, to actually bring that down to zero. And I think that is an amazing goal, and actually one that is possible. If you look at what's happening, happened to poverty over the last 10, 20 years, the world is succeeding in addressing poverty. And so we now talk about uh, economic prosperity, about looking at the bottom 40% of all of the other countries and figuring out how we can raise them up. So I think the amazing thing is we, the world is addressing the poverty problem. We are going very far in solving it. I think in, the life, in our lifetime we will see it solved. And then the question is, all of that energy and all of that money, how do we focus it on empowerment? How do we actually get the individual to grow even faster by giving them the tools to, um, to do that? And you, you used a, a, a wonderful four lines. Uh, platform is the market, community is the capacity, customer is the approach, and empowerment is the key. That, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I think what we're understanding is that governments can't solve everything by themselves. You know, there's there's actually a, uh, a a saying that says the smartest people don't work for you. And when I heard that, I was thinking that's kind of rude. But then I started thinking, of course, that's true because you only have a small group of people who work for you, and you have this massive world out there with all of its creativity. How do you l unlock all of that? How do you get access to that? So, um, when. My experience tells me that what government needs to do is, first of all, decide it's not going to solve all problems. It's not going to solve them the same way. It needs to create a place, a platform for other people to solve those problems using whatever asset information or help the government has. So government is a platform. The second is this idea that community becomes the capacity that, it, uh, that we need to access all of that knowledge and expertise and enthusiasm around the world. And by doing that, we just explode the potential for solving problems. I think the third thing that we've discovered is that much like the private sector, the public sector needs to refocus on solving and problems based on user need. Again, just like uh, the example of the World Bank, government so often comes in and dictates the answer and the solution, and we don't listen to the problem because every community is different. And so we need to figure out how to sw uh, change that paradigm and actually listen to the customer come up with a solution that we hope, we think will solve that problem, and then take that back to the customer and say, did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Tell us. And then iteratively develop the solution in a way that is going to be better, cheaper, faster for the government, but also better, cheaper, faster for the citizen who's going to use that service. And then the final thing, the fourth thing, is this idea of, of empowerment is key. If you look at the fact that we are becoming a connected world, if, if you believe the statistics, 50 billion connections to the Internet by 2020, and that's not all just people, obviously, that's 
things, that's furniture, that's cars, whatever. So we are becoming an incredibly connected world of animate and inanimate objects. If you look at the exponential growth in cellular technologies and how that is enabling uh, vast changes in how we communicate and then you look at the again the connected nature but in terms in this case in terms of social media and how we are much more open and we share and we do so many other things what all of those things are doing and others is just creating this opportunity for change that never was in the case before and i think that is in large part why we're seeing uh, the opportunity for change